us. Genesis chapter 49, beginning in verse 29. The word of the Lord. Then he, that is Jacob, commanded them, that is his sons, and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. So when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And so the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it, for that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him. Seventy days. And when the days of weeping for him were past, Joseph spoke to the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found favor in your eyes, please speak in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me, made me swear, saying, I am about to die. In my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now therefore let me please go up and bury my father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. And so Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. Only their children, their flocks, and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a, a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the, flushing, the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was named Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he commanded them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with a field from Ephron the Hittite to possess as a burying place. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all of the evil that we did to him. So he sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And so now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God, your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and they fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house, Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. The word of the Lord. When the old movie, old movie now, Indiana Jones 
at my last crusade. The main character, if you're not familiar, his name is Indiana Jones. He's an archaeologist. He's in search of treasures. He and his father in this movie are, are following this guidebook that they hope will lead them to the Holy Grail, supposedly the actual cup that Jesus drank from at the, the Last Supper. And supposedly this cup had miraculous healing powers for anyone who drinks out of it. Of course, it's just a fictional movie, but, but, but right at the end of their quest, Indiana Jones' father, he's shot, and he's laying down groaning in, in the background while, while Indiana faces the last big obstacle before him, before he can find the Holy Grail, and the last big obstacle before he can save his father. He's standing on a tall cliff, with a huge chasm from one side to the other, with, with no way to cross. He's faced with the impossible. But then he looks at his little guidebook, and, and he realizes this last test is a leap of faith. He knows he has to hurry. His dad is suffering. And so Indiana gathers his courage. He slowly raises his foot up in the air in front of him and steps out into the abyss. Now again, this is a fictional story, right? But, but the truth is, is that every one of us here faces really the same predicament that Indiana Jones faced in that movie. Right, right. There's so much about our lives that are, that are unknown, that we can't see ahead of us. Wait, where, did, where did I come from? What is the purpose to life? How should I live? What comes next after this life? We, we all stand at a chasm, on a cliff. It's a leap of faith. See, faith is not only for religious people. Everybody has faith, right? Even, even ardent atheists admit that they have faith. They believe in the, the natural laws of the universe. And and they must believe foundationally that, that our minds are able to rationally comprehend the world around us, right? That we're not living in a dream, hypothetically, and we're all going to wake up at some point. Or we're not living in the matrix or something like that. But for the Christian, faith isn't ultimately in the laws of reason, or in the, law, the natural laws, or in reason. It is in the law giver. The ultimate, reasonable, rational creator. Indeed, Scripture says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. As we come to our, our passage this morning, this last chapter in the book of Genesis. Genesis is the, the first book of the Bible. It, it shows us the roots of our faith. Really, the roots of our family tree, our spiritual family tree. And we see in this book first, at the very beginning, how God created the world good, including creating humanity good in order to, to bless humanity. The first thing God does after he creates Adam and Eve is says that he bless them. He wants to shine his favor, his goodness, his life, his love. He wanted to give us himself. And yet we've seen throughout this book, and of course in our own lives, the consequences the carnage of mankind's rebellion against our Creator, what, what the Bible calls sin. And yet the book of Genesis reminds us that despite all of this rebellion, all of this sin, all of this brokenness, that God still promises that glorious blessing. He still promises to give us himself, his love, his life. And what the book of Genesis tells us is that love, that life, that presence of God will come through a man. God promises a man, a Messiah, a Savior who will come to crush the head of the serpent, to defeat sin and death, and ultimately to bring and fulfill God's blessing in the whole world. And so God, in the book of Genesis, prepares a family, a family of a nation, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's then renamed Israel. And this is the, the, the family, the nation, through whom this promised blessing, this Savior, will come. And so our passage this morning, we see the book of Genesis. It, it comes to a close with two deaths, two men dying. A reminder of the consequences of our sin and rebellion against the Lord. Never God's original 
plan for his people. We see first the great patriarch Jacob dies. And then at the end, his son Joseph as well. Now Genesis ends, there's still 1,800 years until the Savior Jesus will be born in a manger in Bethlehem. And yet we see even here a picture of faith in that future promise of salvation. And in fact, we see two practical pictures of faith. That my prayer is that we would be encouraged by today and that we could um, uh, apply to our own lives. So the emphasis of our passage this morning is simply this. Our passage is calling us to trust in God's salvation promise in your death and also in your life. Trust the, the end of his salvation, that when you die, you will be raised again. But also trust the means of that salvation, that God is carrying us every step of the way. So let's see first. Let's look at this call to trust in God's salvation promise, even in the midst of death. And we see there the beginning of our passage and the end of our passage, kind of a bookends here. Jacob's death and Joseph's death. Both have the same message for us. So if you look at me at the end of chapter 49, our text began, begins with a funeral. The Israelites, about 70 people in all, not much of a nation, just a big family. They find themselves in Egypt. Jacob's favorite son, Joseph, he had been scorned by his brothers, sold, left for dead. He was raised up by God in Egypt. But, but for God's purpose to save not only Egypt, but also the Israelite family from a seven-year famine. And so because of Joseph's favor with Pharaoh, the king had given the Israelites a special land during the famine, a fertile land, the land of Goshen, where they would herd their cattle and grow in number, be fruitful and multiply. Last week, we saw in chapter 49 that Jacob blessed and prophesied the future of each of his 12 sons, and that they would grow into 12 tribes of a nation of millions. And now, Jacob dies. Now, even though he's in the comforts of Egypt, look with me at chapter 49 and verse 29, the first, uh, the first verse that we read. Jacob says, I am to be gathered to my people. That means I'm about to die. Bury me with my fathers. He makes Joseph, he makes his sons promise to bury him back, all the way back up in the land of Canaan. The land that the Lord had promised to him and to all of the Israelites. In the same tomb where his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham were buried. Chapter 50 begins with a, a time of weeping and mourning over Jacob, over his loss. And perhaps you, you've been to a funeral recently. Perhaps you, maybe it wasn't recent, but you lost someone significant to you. Maybe you're a widow or a widower. If you've lost a, a child or, or a parent or a grandparent, and you felt the pain and the sting of that loss, even today, know that God's word does not dismiss the pain of grief, the difficulties of losing loved ones. So they're weeping over Jacob. It says as well, they're weeping for, for 70 days after they embalm him in verse 3. It tells us that. And then in verse 4, Joseph goes. He gets permission before Pharaoh. And he says, Pharaoh, would you let me? You're the boss, right? I'm number two in Egypt. But would you let me go and bury my father back in the promised land? And, and Pharaoh, in verse 7, says, yes, I will let you go. And not only that, he sends all of his servants, all of his elders with him. And then verse 8 tells us that all of the Israelites went too, except for their children and the flocks. They stayed to, to watch the flocks. But, but every sort of elder in Israel went, journeyed back to the promised land. Verse 8 says this is a, a huge spectacle with chariots and, and horsemen. Verse 11 says the Canaanites were, were even shocked. Like what? What are the Egyptians doing here? Because they were mostly Egyptians at the time. That's how many Egyptians were sent. And they say, well, wouldn't they be burying someone in Egypt? What is this big mourning going on in Canaan? They bury Jacob in Machpelah, in that tomb. And then they return back to Egypt. Now, I want us to remember that the idea of Jacob being buried in Canaan, the promised land, it's not just about family nostalgia. It's not just, hey, I want to be buried next to my father and my, my grandfather, my mother. No, no. 
Jacob was declaring where his true home was. Right? Even though at this time they only owned this tiny plot of land, Jacob remembered God's promise that was that his people, that God would give his people the entire land of Canaan. And it's interesting. It, it's, it's helping to set the stage for the next book of the Bible we have, the Exodus. In fact, it even says that as they go in verses 10 and 11, if you look there, in verse 10 and 11, it mentions that as they traveled, they were beyond the Jordan. For, for some reason, the, the, the path they took took them around the other side. So when they crossed into the promised land, into Canaan, they crossed the Jordan River. And this is the same path that the Israelites would take in the Exodus 400 years later, freed from slavery, journeying to the promised land. This is almost a dress rehearsal for God's salvation plan for them. And then think about the brothers as well. They're, they're going there. They're, they're burying their father hundreds of miles away in this postage stamp of, of land that they have, thinking this is all going to belong to them. And yet they would turn and go back to Egypt, and they would never themselves set their own eyes on that land again, at least that we know of. So that's the burial of Jacob. And let's look at the end of the passage now. In verse 22, in, in the end, it's very similar. Much time has passed. It's condensed. 110 years of, jo of Joseph's life go by now. Jacob's favorite son, Joseph. He's been blessed by the Lord to see his children and his grandchildren. It says there in verse 23, to the third generation. And this is an aside, but, but Scripture talks about the blessing of children. You know, it's interesting coming out of Fenway Kids Adventure Week and all this effort and time we, we spent not just to have fun with kids, but to share the good news of Jesus with them and the love of Jesus with them. It's because God cares about children. Jesus welcomes the little ones to run to him. And God's word says this is a blessing to be a parent. I think in our day and age, children are often look at, looked at as burdens, maybe to avoid or to, to minimize but God's word says no children are a blessing from God. And it is a blessing especially to be grandparents for those of you who are grandparents here. But now Joseph is about to die. Now he makes his family a similar promise that his dad Jacob did. He says, hey, hey I, I want you to bury me in the promised land. Except there's one difference. Do you see the difference? He says, don't take me there now. I want you to wait. Wait until the Lord visits you. That, that God is going to take you up out of Egypt and it's going to be a divine intervention. It's not going to happen by normal means. It will be a special visitation of God to save you and bring you up out of here into the promised land. And when God does that, take my bones with you. What incredible faith for, for Joseph to say. And you know what? In Joshua chapter 24, the Israelites, have, they've, they've gone through the exodus, they've gone through the wilderness and all of that. They're, they're entered into the promised land. And Joshua chapter 24 says this. It says, As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father, <coughs> father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. That's Joshua 24, 32. That, that place that was fulfilled, Joseph's promise. They were faithful after hundreds of years, 400 plus years. And look what the, the New Testament author of Hebrews says. He says, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Friends, th this is a reminder for us to have faith in the Lord. But what faith looks like, the first picture, is to have faith first and foremost in something beyond our life today. Here we have two men who are dying, but, but two men who are following the Lord with such great faith in God's salvation promise and purpose, even beyond their own earthly lives. Right? This is the root of faith that, that was, we find ultimately in, in the blessed Savior who has come, Jesus Christ. That, that we believe in Christ, not so, ultimately, that God might make us comfortable in this life. 
We, we, we believe in Christ not so that he will help us accomplish our political goals or political or economic agenda for our nation, whatever nation we're in. We, we believe in Christ not even ultimately so we can make this world a little bit of a better place. Friends, we believe in Jesus first and foremost for eternal life, life after this life, for a hope that can transcend death, not to make life a little bit better, but to renew and restore all of life for eternity by the work of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John three sixteen, friends. I wonder, Christian, do you believe this? Kind of the simple ABCs of the gospel, right? That we are living for eternity. But, but do you really believe, church, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5. So do you really believe that, that whoever holds on to their life will lose it, but he who gives up his life and puts their life in Jesus' hands will find it? Matthew 16. Do you really believe, 2 Corinthians 4, that, that this light momentary affliction in this life is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison? That, that we look at things not that are, are seen, but we look to things that are unseen, that are eternal. Do you really believe that Jesus came, Hebrews 2 tells us, to not only destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, but also to deliver us, deliver all who would believe from a slavery to a fear of death. Friends, I've said this before. You, you might be afraid of dying. I'm, I'm afraid, not of death itself, but I'm, I'm afraid of, you know, if, if I'm going to have a painful death. You know, that's natural to be afraid. Is it going to hurt when I die? There's, there's, really, there's real pain in the world. But friends, if you're a Christian here this morning, my hope and my prayer, Hebrews 2 says, we should not fear stepping off that platform into the unknown. We should trust that if we are not here in the body, that we are present with the Lord Jesus. And friends, don't let anyone tell you that you can be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. No, Scripture tells us that we're to lay up treasures in heaven. It tells us that we are citizens of heaven. It, it tells us to set our minds on things above where Christ is in heaven, not on things on the earth. So I wonder, in the midst of everything in our world telling us this next election season, this, this issue, something going at work is like the most important thing that we might remember as Christians, that no, no. We can love our neighbors well. We can be faithful. But the most important thing is where you stand before God. And that God holds us, all who believe in him, for eternity. And I wonder, are you ready to go home when he calls you? Look, I know we all have our plans. You have career, family, study, all of that. But I wonder, are, are you excited to be in glory with Christ? Do you long for it? Even, even though you can't see it, even though we couldn't describe heaven very much from the scriptures. There's lots of imagery, but there's not a lot to say except a place of joy and life and no more mourning, pain, tears. As I pray, I pray that you can and that we long for this. And that even after today, this passage, we'd have a renewed longing for eternal life with Christ because the whole reason Christ came to die and be raised again so that he might be the first fruits, so that just like he was raised again, so might we be raised again. Church, I can't think of something more encouraging, by the way, that a way you can encourage a brother or sister in the Lord than reminding them of their eternal future. We encourage them of the hope we have for eternal life. And you know, as a pastor, I've sat with many people who were dying. A few people who were dying. Talked to many people about death. You know, it, it, it seems like we have different views of death. You know, you know many people in our culture, they, they try to deny death. And by that I mean they just pretend it doesn't exist. Like, don't talk about it. That's just, that's morbid. Uh, don't think about it. You know, even if you go to a funeral, you just try to, okay, you grieve a little bit and, and you move on. 
And you just try not to think about it. Even our culture today, it's all about young people today. Right? At least in other cultures, in other cultures, they, they value the wisdom of, of those who are older. But in America, man, we, we, we don't care in our culture here. It's all about the youth. It's part of just our culture of denying the reality of what's coming. Many deny death. Others, though, accept death. Now, obviously, there's a certain amount of acceptance you need, accepting the reality that we will die. If Jesus doesn't come back, every one of us will die. But some go further. Some, some accept death as, as just the, the way of things, as, as the good or the, the reality, the, the only future for us, right? So, some say that it's just part of the circle of life, right? Lion King, you know? They, the, the language, well, we all have our expiration date, Right, where this idea that our existence is kind of by chance or, or by accident, but, but if that's true, then there's not any ultimate purpose for why we exist. There's no ultimate reason for, for why. There's no reason to live in a good way or a bad way because eventually the sun is going to expand and vaporize the earth someday and no one will remember anybody if this is all there is. But friends, the Christian way is not to deny death. Or to simply accept death, but actually to defy death. To, to understand and embrace the reality and the heaviness and the grief of death. But to trust in someone who can overcome it. It's to believe that because of Jesus of Nazareth, he proved himself to be the Son of God by his own resurrection from the dead. That all those who believe in him will rise too. It's to believe in the words of Joseph that God will surely visit me when I die and take me up out of the grave into the promised land of heaven for eternity. So friends, that's our first picture, the faith in God's promise in death. But secondly, we see at the center of this passage, and more briefly, not only trusting in God's promise for the end, but trusting, we should, we're called to trust in God's salvation promise even in every moment, every day of our life. You see that center section beginning in verses 15 to 21. This, this other life-changing promise, this other picture that we see here, after Jacob dies, before Joseph dies, so Jacob is dead. They're finishing up the funeral. They're going back to Egypt. And then verse 15 says that Joseph's brothers are scared. They're scared because their father is dead and they know that they had sinned greatly against their brother, that they had plotted to kill him, that they had, when he was a 17-year-old kid, they had thrown him in a pit. When he was begging for his life, they were eating lunch, thinking, do we kill him or sell him to slavery? Okay, we'll sell him into slavery. They sell him into slavery to Egypt. And so now they think, well, okay, Joseph was just being nice because our dad was alive. But now that dad's dead, he's going to get his revenge. And Joseph, he's second in command of all of Egypt. He has all of the power in this situation. But look, Joseph had forgiven his brothers in chapter 45. But if you look now at verse 15, the brothers are scared. They're scared that he will pay us back for the evil that we did to him says Joseph had no desire to play God. He certainly wasn't in a position to execute revenge for himself, and yet he trusted the Lord to sort everything out. How do we prevent against revenge? Trusting in the Lord's plan, in the Lord's sovereignty, and actually in God's justice, his judgment against evil. Romans 12 says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome, excuse me, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Joseph entrusted the justice of the Lord to him and not to himself. He wasn't trying to play God. But he also trusts the providence of God, that God's hand is at work, that God's hand is at work even through their evil actions. 
And this is where we get to this glorious and mysterious truth, what Joseph says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Right, just how, how God created all things good in the beginning in Genesis 1. We're reminded now that God not only creates all things good, but he sustains and does all things, orders all things ultimately for good. In Genesis 50, we see that. God can have no evil thoughts. God can have no evil plans. God can do no evil actions. And yet, as we see here, God can work his good purpose even through the evil plots of sinful people. Right, right. You notice that, that Joseph does not say, you meant it for evil, but God flipped it around and turned it out for good. Right, God does not make lemonade out of lemons. He's not like a cosmic chess player who's, who's there, you know, the devil is making moves and he's like, oh, I got gotcha. you, checkmate, as if he's, he's not in control and just responding to everything that's going on. No, no, no. God's word says, look at that verse, that every step of the way, this, at the same time they are doing evil, God is working above and beyond and in and through ultimately for good. This is a glorious truth of God's providence, friends. At the same time that these brothers were acting out of their wicked schemes, God was acting through those wicked schemes for his own purposes. God knew what he was doing. He was doing exactly what he intended to do. And yet those brothers were still responsible for their actions. Friends, God's sovereignty it is absolute. Right? Let's not fall for platitudes that just say that God, oh yeah, God's in control. He's in charge, generally. No, specifically in every area of your life, to the smallest speck, to the tiniest part of that plan, right? God's word says he knows every hair that is on our head. And that's more for some of us than for others of us, amen? But he knows everyone. Ephesians 1 says he works all things according to the counsel of his will. Job 42 says he can do all things. None of his purpose can be thwarted. Which raises the question, then what is God's purpose what is this good that he is working towards? And we see it right there in verse 20. Look at me at verse 20, right there. Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why? What good? To bring about that many people should be kept alive. For salvation. God's purpose in doing all things is to bring glory to himself through the salvation of his people. Friends, friends, what a comfort is it to know that God is never surprised, he's never caught off guard, that, that even seemingly chaotic events, even evil events, even our own sins and errors, that God uses them for his good. It's a good reason not to beat yourself up too much when you sin. A good reason to run back to the cross, trusting that even God uses even sinfulness, even bad sermons God uses for his glory. This is why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, in the context of suffering, he says all creation is groaning, it is hard, life is difficult, and yet we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good to those who are called according to his purpose. And that good is our salvation, that we would be formed in Christ-likeness. Now I realize for some of you here, this might be hard to take in, hard to believe, that really all things have some hidden good purpose. But I want us to first think about the alternatives. If that is not true, then the alternative is, is either a world without God or a world which God is not in control. And so it's of chaos and chance. Then you're really out of control. And as we know, as much as we try to control our lives, right? Over the weekend, one little software update showed us that, right? For those of us who were flying or who saw the news how little control we have. And you're right that it would be tough to see good come from a lot of evil things that happen. Most of the time, we can never see God's ultimate good purpose yet in this life for the evil that happens. But I, I want you to think, if, if we are finite as we are, and if God is who he is, then might it be possible that God would allow or even ordain certain things to happen that we might not fully understand yet? 
Or, or as one pastor put it, when we're praying, can we trust that even as we're praying to God and he's not answering our prayers the way we want, that, that if we somehow could know everything that God knew, that we would answer our prayers the same way? Can we trust that we are children and God is our Father? And in fact, God is so much bigger and greater and more awesome than we are, totally other, that we're not going to be able to understand everything. But can we trust his goodness? And when we don't understand, can we look to the cross? Can we look to Jesus, what was the darkest day in all of human history? But Christians believe the only perfect person to ever live, God's own son, beaten, tortured, slaughtered, killed on a cross. And yet now we call that day Good Friday. Because Jesus paid for our sins. Whereas the apostle Peter, Peter would preach in one of the very first Christian sermons when the church was founded. He said this to this very people who crucified Jesus, the Jewish leaders. He said, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men. You see the sovereignty of God and yet still responsibility of man. Church, God not only saves you in death, he sovereignly saves and sustains you in every single moment, every single aspect of your life. Not just that God will sort everything out in the end, but the Lord is walking with you and is in fact ordaining all things, even the hard things, ultimately for his good saving purpose. So because of that, just like Joseph said to his brothers, hear God's word for you. We do not have to fear, even if we're faced with incredible difficulty. The emphasis of the passage, trust in God's salvation promise, not just in your death, yes, for your death, but also in your life. I'm going to spoil the end of Indiana Jones of the movie came out in 1989, so I'm sorry if I'm spoiling it for you. He's standing there on the precipice. He's got his foot outstretched, about to step just right down into the abyss. And he steps out into what was sort of a camouflaged magic. I don't know what it was. It's a movie, right? Uh, to a, a platform there, a little bridge. And his foot lands with a thud on a solid bridge, on solid ground. And the camera pans to show him standing on his narrow rock bridge, sort of deceptively carved. And he, he crosses over to the other side. He grabs the Holy Grail. Successful. So friends, I want to ask you, what, what are you standing on in your life? We're all there at the precipice. I want to invite you to turn to Jesus as your solid rock. He's the only solid foundation both in our life and in our death. There's a great pastor in New York City for many decades. He died recently. His name was Timothy Keller. You probably read some of his books or heard his sermons. A couple years ago, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He fought it for a couple of years as best as he could. But it was last year that he succumbed to the disease and he died. Tim Keller is a man who trusted in God's salvation promise both in all the events of his life and even to his death. And in fact, shortly before his, de before his death, um, Tim, he prayed this with his family. His family would later share. He prayed this prayer. He said, I'm thankful for all the people who've prayed for me over the years. I'm thankful for my family that loves me. I'm thankful for the time God has given me. But I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. Friends, may it be with each of us too. Let's pray.